Six. Well, this is uh, Ted O'Conn, uh, Executive Director of the Community Oncology Alliance. We will start the presentation in uh, 30 seconds. I see some other people are uh, are joining. Um, So I think we'll get going. It's uh, two minutes after one. I want to keep this going. Um, in a minute, I am going to introduce uh, Aaron uh, Vanderbilt from um, uh, BRG, the Berkeley Research Group, who was the uh, lead on this uh, study. And uh, Aaron, if you, uh, as I said, a couple words here, if you make sure you star uh, six your phone so that you can uh, jump on and start. Just want to give a, a just a, a little one minute perspective on this is that um, there is a lot of um, a lack of some information on the 340D program as well as uh, some statistics that are sometimes um, used that are I think inappropriate and the reason why Un COA undertook this uh, study. Um, with the sponsorship of uh, BMS and also Pharma was that we uh, wanted to uh, literally put the, the program in perspective in terms of, especially on the hospital side, the growth, the trends in the growth, and uh, where the program is at now, and especially look at the oncology sector. So uh, we had a series of uh, questions uh, that we wanted to look at uh, when we awarded uh, uh, DRG, this study, and uh, basically what we wanted to do was um, make sure those got covered. So we actually reached out to um, uh, a lot of uh, staff on uh, Capitol Hill that have looked at this, this area to make sure that um, they had some input to it as well, too. So that's what the purpose of this study was. I want to underscore something I always say because I always get misquoted, um, is that the 340B program is a very valuable uh, safety net program for patients. In fact, it's so valuable that um, it's important to make sure that it's patients who are benefiting by the program in terms of having a safety net under them. Um, there are two facets of the program that I like to think, one dealing with the federal grantees that are held to a high level of transparency and accountability and in different standards for on the hospital side. So I, I want to underscore that um, uh, personally, I believe this is a safety net program that's very important. Uh, COA has a statement on 340B, which is up on the website, which clearly states um, COA's position, the board's position on the program, and also uh, some of the problems we see with the program that need to be fixed again so that the program meets uh, the needs of those patients in need. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Aaron Vanderbilt. Um, Aaron, as I said, was the lead on this study by BRG or the Berkeley Research Group. And uh, Aaron, if you make sure you're star sixing, um, uh, you're, the con is yours. Uh, <clears throat> great. Uh, assuming everybody is able to hear me, um, I, what I'd like to do today is uh, walk you through quickly the objectives of the study and, and the key findings. And then from there, we're going to drill down into uh, the findings. I'm going to be showing a lot of charts and graphs. I'm going to be talking about uh, a lot of the context uh, around this program. Uh, we're going to look at the current size of the program. Uh, and, and how we got there uh, from uh, looking all the way back to 2000 to today. Uh, I'm going to speak to what has been driving growth in this program, and then I'm going to leave you with a set of, uh, of statistics that speak to some of the recent trends in this program and, and why I believe that there will uh, remain a, a lot of growth in this program over the next uh, three to five years. Um, I know that there's also an intent to have um, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end, um, so I'm going to make sure that we leave plenty of time for that. Um, so 
when we talk about uh, this study, and I, I know that Ted has mentioned already uh, some of the rationale for doing this work, but, but when we got started, uh, there were several uh, objectives of the study. First, we wanted to understand the size of the program and growth in the program along uh, several alternative dimensions. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, of research out there on the 340B program, and the, the program is often put into a context of overall um, drug spending in the U.S. I'm going to make the case that, that there's an argument for looking at this more as it relates to the, the hospital outpatient market, and I'm going to present some alternative dimensions such as what does the 340B program look like when viewed in terms of hospital outpatient revenue? What does the program look like when viewed in terms of Medicare Part B hospital outpatient drug reimbursement. Uh, from there, we're going to drill down specifically into what's happening in the oncology marketplace. I, I know that's obviously a, a big focus of COA and, and of probably great interest to a lot of you on the phone today. So we're going to we're going to drill down and look at what's happening as it relates specifically to oncology drugs. Uh, we're going to be looking at historical growth in oncology drug spend at 340B hospitals versus non-340B hospitals. And we're also going to do some comparisons of Part B drug reimbursements in the hospital setting, uh, specifically at 340B hospitals, and um, comparing that to what's happening in the community oncology practices. So, so those were the objectives that we started out with. In terms of what we found, uh, there were there were several sets of statistics that uh, I think surprised uh, quite a few of us. I've been studying this program since 2010. Um, I, I have a very good handle on what's been driving the program and, and how the program is growing. Some of these statistics surprised even me. So, so let me leave you, let me introduce the initial finding, which was that hospitals enrolled in the 340B program. Currently, and when I say currently, I mean in 2013, the, the latest year in which we have uh, this data, hospitals enrolled in the 340B program received 58% of all of the Medicare Part B, this is fee-for-service, hospital outpatient drug reimbursement. Over 60% if we limit that view to just oncology drugs. So, so what this is saying is that 340B hospitals, when viewed in the context of all hospitals that receive Part B reimbursement, account for about 60% uh, of, uh, of hospital outpatient drug reimbursement. That's a big number, um, and, and it's grown substantially in the last four years. The, the same metrics measured in 2010 were 43% and 47% respectively. So the 340B program has gone from, in 2010, being 43% of total Part B drug reimbursement uh, now to 58% in 2013. I've done a lot of work uh, with, with manufacturers and, and with other entities, and, and I can assure you that this number has increased even over the last two years. So we're certainly well above 60% uh, at this point. Uh, so that was the, the first finding. In terms of growth and what's driving growth, there, there really, over the last couple of years, there, there have been two uh, main drivers. First, the Affordable Care Act um, created new eligibility pathways. And so uh, critical access hospitals, full community hospitals, several other entities have gotten access, uh, have, have become eligible for the 340B program, and, and they've enrolled. At the same time, uh, hospitals that have always, uh, dish hospitals that have always been uh, able to participate, depending on their dish percentages, um, have, have also grown in terms of new enrollments. And so uh, newly enrolled hospitals uh, certainly are a big driver of historical growth. The other thing that's happening is that those hospitals that have participated in the 340B program on an ongoing basis from 2010 to 2013, they have also gotten bigger. And, and what we're seeing is that over the last four years, those hospitals that um, have, have remained in the program 
uh, during this period of time from 2010 to 2013 have increased from being 37% of all um, hospital outpatient revenue to 40%. So those hospitals that are in the program are getting bigger. We have more hospitals that are participating in the bro program. Both of those things are driving growth. In another finding from the study, if we look specifically at oncology drugs, and if we look at Part B reimbursement for oncology drugs, there's been a, a very significant change in the, in the mix of reimbursement over the last four years. So between 2010 and 2013, 340B hospitals have experienced a 123% increase in Part B reimbursements for oncology drugs. That compared to a 31% increase at non-340B hospitals. And during that same time period, reimbursement to physician offices, which has historically been the largest um, component of Part B reimbursement for oncology drugs, has actually declined by 5% over the last uh, four years. There's a number of different factors that are driving this. Um, the most important of which is the shift in site of care from the physician office setting to the hospital outpatient setting. I know that um, that Ted and others have uh, have spoken to this in, in the past. Uh, this data certainly confirms that there's a, a shift in this site of care, and as a result, we're seeing 340B hospitals with much larger volumes of, of Part B reimbursement for oncology drugs. Uh, the, the last two findings from the study, and then we're going to get into the details here, is that um, first, 340B hospitals receive over 50% more uh, Part B drug reimbursement per beneficiary per day than community oncology practices. So when a patient is seen in the hospital setting and uh, is a Medicare fee-for-service patient, on average, the Medicare program is paying 50% more for that patient um, per day than when the, when the patient is seen in the community setting. Um, again, we've got a lot more detail to, sh to show on this point, um, but it speaks to the utilization in 340B hospitals and the relative efficiency in the community setting. Um, and then lastly, the 340B program, uh, particularly in hospitals, is driven uh, in large part by the oncology marketplace. Over 40% of all Part B drug reimbursement to 340B hospitals is for oncology drugs. It's without question the single largest therapeutic area um, in terms of Part B drug reimbursement, and um, and it is, uh, as we've noted in some of the previous bullets here, it is uh, growing and has been for the last three or four years. So, so those are the key findings. Let's talk now about the current size of the program. So I mentioned at the outset that historically, the 340B program um, has been characterized or, or put into the context of the overall uh, U.S drug marketplace. And, and I think historically, certainly at the beginning of the program in the, in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, uh, that made sense. When the program got started, there were only about a, actually less than 100 hospitals that participated in the 340B program uh, versus uh, literally tens of thousands of clinics, um, family planning clinics, uh, Ryan White clinics, black lung clinics, a lot of other grantees that participated in the program, and so it was a it was a very diverse program, and I, I think there was some I think it did make sense to think about the program in the context of the overall uh, U.S. drug sales. However, this has changed dramatically over the last seven to eight years. Um, I, I published a study last November that looked at current utilization through the 340B program, and we looked at that utilization by entity type, by the, the type of 340B covered entity. And you can see the pie chart here at the bottom of the slide. And what it shows is that hospitals, dish hospitals, critical access hospitals, sole community hospitals, uh, pediatric hospitals, et cetera, 
account for almost 90% of all purchases that go through the 340B program. So in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, the program was, uh, you know, focused on community health centers, focused on Ryan White clinics. Um, today, the 340B program has really become a discounted hospital outpatient purchasing program. That's not to say that the program is not um, still very important to those uh, Ryan White clinics or community health centers that continue to participate, but if you look at the program as a whole, it really is now dominated by the hospital outpatient setting. And so I think there's wisdom in putting the 340B program into the context of the hospital outpatient setting. And so if you look at these next two charts, we've done exactly that. So the chart on the left shows um, 340B hospital outpatient revenue as a percentage of total hospital outpatient revenue. So we focused on outpatient revenue because, as probably most of you know, uh, the 340B program is an outpatient-specific program. Um, hospitals uh, are not able to purchase 340B drugs for utilization in the inpatient setting. So we wanted to characterize the, the program in terms of hospital outpatient revenues. And you can see the clear growth trend. In 2000, 2001, 2002, um, 340B hospitals accounted for about 10% of all hospital outpatient revenue. You can see in 2004, there, there began a significant upward trend, and that continued on to where we are today in 2013, where 340B hospitals account for about 47% of all hospital outpatient revenue. Um, so over time, the program has become more and more and more focused on uh, hospitals. There's greater and greater participation on the part of hospitals. And so it begins to make sense to think about it in the, in the context of um, the hospital outpatient setting. Now, outpatient revenue considers a, a pretty broad mix of services of which um, drug, uh, drug utilization is just one of those. So the chart on the right is really drilling down uh, in specifically into drug reimbursement. So we're looking at Medicare fee-for-service um, Part B drug reimbursement here to 340B hospitals. And we're saying, okay, now let's get more specific than just the overall outpatient department. What percentage of drug reimbursement is going to 340B hospitals? And what, what we're seeing, and you can see the trend line from 2008 to 2013 is that um, in the light blue line, um, 340B hospitals have gone from accounting for about 43% of all drug reimbursement to just under 60% by 2013. The gray line is limited to just the oncology products, and you can see by 2013, um, 340B hospitals now receive 60% of all hospital outpatient Part B drug reimbursement. Um, Significant growth over the last six years, and, and as I noted, um, that growth has continued over the last uh, over the last couple of years. So, so that's where we are in terms of the 340B program today, um, and and how and you can see how the program has grown. Uh, but but let's look now at some of the specific drivers of growth in the program, and, and I want to focus on. Uh, two things, as I noted at the outset. I want to focus on new enrollments, um, those uh, hospitals that are participating in the program for the first time, and I want to focus on what's happening at hospitals that have uh, continued to participate. So this chart here shows uh, new enrollments in the 340B program. In 2010, uh, the Affordable Care Act was implemented, and it created new eligibility pathways in the 340B program. And for the first time, uh, critical access hospitals, sole community hospitals, uh, cancer centers, rural referral centers, uh, and pediatric hospitals were able to participate in the program. And so the solid blue line shows the cumulative count 
of new enrollments in the program. And you can see that between 2010 and 2014, um, over 1,200 hospitals have enrolled in the program for the first time. Um, and, and these are non-DISH hospitals, that those hospitals that became eligible for the first time uh, through the Affordable Care Act. When that act was passed in, in 2010, um, or, or perhaps in late 2009, but um, when, when that act was passed, this was, this was known. The idea that there were going to be a lot of new hospitals participating in the program, that was predictable. I think what has um, perhaps surprised people is the continued rate of growth in DISH hospitals. So DISH hospitals, if they meet certain criteria, uh, a DISH metric of 11.75% or higher, as well as nonprofit status uh, in government contracts, they've always been eligible to participate in the program. And, and growth in these types of hospitals, DISH hospitals, has really been more a function of growth in the DISH percentage. Um, and what this chart is showing is that there continue to be quite a few DISH hospitals that enroll in the program for the first time. So you can see from 2010 through 2014, uh, over 300 DISH hospitals have enrolled in the 340B program for the first time. Um, and this trend is also going to continue uh, because of the effect of Medicaid expansion and, and how uh, Medicaid expansion is resulting in higher DISH percentages and more hospitals are, um, as a result, able to enroll in the program for the first time. So this trend in new enrollments is uh, translating into significant incremental purchases through the 340B program. So what this chart is showing is the breakout of 2013 Part B drug reimbursement by type of hospital. So we're looking at um, in the in the solid dark blue part of the circle that accounts for 77% of all of these, um, of, of all the 2013 outpatient Part B drug reimbursement, this is the percentage of, of reimbursement that went to those hospitals, DISH hospitals, that were enrolled in the program prior to 2010. Since 2010, 23% of the reimbursement is now going to hospitals that have enrolled in the program for the first time. And you can see that it's broken out between DISH hospitals that enrolled for the first time and non-DISH hospitals that enrolled for the first time. And I, I want to focus your attention for a minute on the relative size of these two. So you can see for those 324 DISH hospitals that enrolled for the first time, they account for 8.4% of the total purchases. Uh, uh, or I should say, of the total drug reimbursement. And the non-DISH hospitals, the 1,222 non-DISH hospitals, account for 14.2%. So what this is telling you is, and, and this is in some respects kind of common sense, but the DISH hospitals that enroll in the program are much larger uh, hospitals than the critical access hospitals, the sole community hospitals, uh, the rural referral centers. And so when you go back to this slide and you think about what's going to drive growth in the future, um, as more DISH hospitals become eligible for the 340B program through Medicaid expansion, they are going to continue to drive uh, significant incremental purchases. Um, and, and so we think this story of growth is going to continue. Um, but that's just one of the one of the ways in which the program has grown uh, over the last uh, five or six years. The other thing that's happening is that 340B hospitals that are ha have always participated in the, in the program are also getting bigger. Um, so let me frame up what this analysis is showing. What we're doing here is we're comparing non-340B hospitals that have never participated in the program at any point between 2010 and 2013, and we're comparing first outpatient revenue, second Part B oncology drug reimbursement to 340B hospitals that have participated in the program each year, 2010 through 2013. So we're isolating 
um, hospitals whose 340B enrollment status has, has remained consistent. And there's, there's an interesting finding here. Um, when you look at outpatient revenue and you compare outpatient revenue at this cohort of hospitals that's never participated in the program, we see that outpatient revenue grew by about 30% between 2010 and 2013. It went from $425 billion to $553 billion. For the cohort of hospitals that participated in the 340B program on an ongoing basis, they also experienced about 30, 32% growth. They went from $304 billion to $402 billion. So when measured by hospital outpatient revenue, the non-340B hospitals and the 340B hospitals actually look pretty similar. But when you drill down and you look at what's happening in the oncology marketplace, the story is very different. So this is the same set of hospitals. When you look at the non-340B hospitals, their growth rate was 58%. Um, Part B oncology drug reimbursement went from $494 million to $781 million. But for the same cohort of 340B hospitals, that growth was 86%, $529 million to $982 million. So the 340B hospitals, their outpatient programs are growing, and, and in, in overall rates, they're growing similar to non-340B hospitals, but they're targeted, their growth is targeted in services that involve significant drug reimbursement, like uh, oncology uh, services, chemotherapy administration. And so um, as a result, when you look at what's happening with, with drug reimbursement, we see a, a, a very different story of growth where 340B hospital growth is far outstripping uh, what's happening in the non-340B hospitals. And from a financial perspective, this makes perfect sense. 340B hospitals receive basically the same type of reimbursement um, as non-340B hospitals. 340B hospitals, their, their drug reimbursement is based on the same ASP formula that non-340B hospitals are, but their costs are much, much lower because they have access to the discounted 340B price. So you can see that the growth has been focused in an area where the margins are much, much better for the hospital. So this, of course, plays out in a number of different ways, and the biggest way that it plays out for the oncology marketplace is this shift in site of care. In order to grow 86%, as we're seeing on this previous slide, in order to be able to grow 86% in terms of their um, Part B oncology drug reimbursement, that speaks to the idea of a, a shift inside of care. The only way to grow that much is to acquire other practices, other community oncology practices that are in the same geographic space. And if we look at Medicare fee-for-service oncology claims by site of care, we can see this shift inside of care very clearly. Um, in 2009, about 80% of all uh, fee-for-service oncology claims were in the physician office setting. About 20% was in the hospital outpatient setting. By 2013, that um, split had gone from 80-20 to 66-34. So in, in five years, um, this, this shift inside of care has, has led to almost a little over a third of all uh, oncology claims occurring in the hospital outpatient setting. And if you apply a fairly straightforward regression to this, um, to this shift inside of care, this historical trend, and you project out into the future, what you see is that by 2018, almost half of all oncology claims will be occurring in the hospital outpatient setting. This has, of course, a significant impact on community oncologists. I, I think that goes without saying, and I think that um, 
probably a lot of the, the people on this call um, ha have experienced this firsthand. Um, it also has a, a um, kind of a, a policy implication and, and certainly a um, overall Medicare reimbursement implication because what's happening is that these oncology claims are being shifted away from the physician office setting, which is a fairly efficient site of care, to a less efficient site of care, at least when you measure it by um, Part B oncology reimbursement per beneficiary per day. So let's look at the chart on the right. So what the chart on the right shows is exactly what the title says. It shows the average Medicare Part B drug reimbursement per beneficiary per day, and it trends it over time. So in 2010, um, hospitals, and this is 340B hospitals specifically here, 340B hospitals were receiving about $1,700 per beneficiary per day in terms of the oncology drug reimbursement, whereas community oncology practices were receiving about 1,200, 1,226. Over the course of the last four years, that average amount has increased at 340B hospitals from 1,700 to over 1,900. In the community setting, it's remained almost exactly constant. It's gone from 1,226 to 1,266. So this shift in site of care is moving patients away from the community setting and into the hospital setting. And predominantly this shift is happening and, and moving claims into the 340B hospitals. Um, and so there's, there's a, a, an efficiency question that, um, that ultimately drives higher uh, Part B reimbursement. Um, a lot of you may be aware of this. The GAO recently did a study which found that uh, when comparing 340B hospitals to non-340B hospitals, there were much, much higher rates. I think the rate was actually almost double, much higher rates of um, total Part B reimbursement per beneficiary in the 340B hospitals versus the non-340B hospitals. And there's the, the GAO study, anyways, raised some questions as to whether the drug margins uh, plays a role in this in these utilization patterns um, that we see playing out between 340B hospitals and non-340B hospitals. So, um, so we, we see this dynamic playing out. We, we believe that this trend is going to continue. And one of the reasons we think this trend is going to continue is what's happening in the contract pharmacy space. So as a quick refresher, um, 340B hospitals are able to establish contractual relationships with pharmacies. And they are then able, the, the hospitals are then able to characterize prescriptions that are filled in those hospitals for patients that were seen in the hospital as 340B scripts. So if a patient is seen in a hospital and receives a prescription and they go fill that prescription at the Walgreens Pharmacy down the street, that prescription can be recharacterized as a 340B script, and the hospital realizes a financial gain as a result of that transaction. Um, in 2010, HRSA, which is the government agency that oversees the 340B program, uh, for the first time allowed all covered entities to contract with as many pharmacies uh, as they wanted. Historically, covered entities have only been able to contract with a single pharmacy. So this was a significant change. And not surprisingly, what we see is that um, the number of covered entities that are establishing these contract pharmacy relationships has grown dramatically. So in the blue bars, the solid blue bars, this shows the number of distinct covered entities that have at least one retail contract pharmacy. So this is the Walgreens or the CVS or the Rite Aid or the independent pharmacy across the street or, or around the corner. Um, and so in the first quarter of 2010, uh, there were a little over 900 distinct covered entities that were contracting with at least one retail pharmacy. 
And you can see the growth trend by 2015, by the second quarter of 2015, there's over 3,000 distinct covered entities that have at least one uh, retail contract pharmacy relationship. This growth curve, you can see it's not slowing down. It's not expected to slow down uh, in, in the near term. There's naturally going to be a ceiling to this growth, but in the, in the near term anyways, we think this trend is going to continue. What, what did not occur as quickly is the adoption of mail order or specialty pharmacies. And, and this is particularly important in the oncology marketplace because, as I'm sure most of you know, um, the, the oral products, the self-administered products that are, are typically prescribed to oncology patients, um, they're often very expensive, and the payers often um, steer the, the filling of those prescriptions into a specialty channel or into a mail order channel. And so the adoption of mail order and specialty pharmacies did not occur um, as quickly. So you can see that in 2010, there were very few, there were only 30 or 40 covered entities that had established a um, contract pharmacy relationship with a specialty or mail order product. And it increased a little bit between 2010 and, and the second quarter of 2013, but not a lot. It, it really wasn't until July of 2013 that we began to see a rapid adoption of mail order and specialty pharmacies. And today, almost 1,000 entities, um, covered entities, are contracting with at least one mail order or specialty pharmacy. And this rate of growth um, is expected to continue and, and potentially even accelerate because this trend is, is somewhat reinforcing of another trend that, that we've spoken about already, which is 340B hospitals acquiring oncology practices. And the reason I say that it's reinforcing is if, if, you, if you adopt the position that one of the factors, and, and I acknowledge and, and recognize that there are many factors, but if one of the factors that plays into uh, a hospital's decision to acquire a community oncology practice is the financial gain that can be realized on 340B drugs, historically, that gain was only um, able to be realized for drugs that were physician administered because the way that the, the 340B program had worked uh, historically was that you really were, were only able to purchase drugs that you would then um, administer directly to the patient or if you had uh, the ability to self-dispense, if you had your, your own dispensing pharmacy, then perhaps you may have the ability to uh, to capture 340B pricing on, on drugs that dispense in your pharmacy. Today, if you're a 340B hospital and you're, you're going through the economics of acquiring a community oncology practice, today you think about both the financial gain on the physician-administered drugs, but also the financial gain on all of the prescriptions that are written for the oral oncolytics or the anti-emetics or, or other types of products that are likely to go through a specialty pharmacy. And you take those into account now, too, because you're now able to contract with um, several of the specialty pharmacies. You can contract with a Credo uh, or Walgreens or, or um, uh, Diplomat or whoever it might be. And so this trend in the growth in specialty pharmacies is reinforcing the trend in the uh, in the hospital acquisitions of oncology practices. So in terms of kind of bringing this all together, what the, the study really showed was that first, we've probably been thinking about the 340B program in the wrong context for the last couple of years. The 340B program really now is driven in large, large part by hospitals. 90% of all purchases are going through hospitals. 90% of, of 340B purchases are going through hospitals. And so when you look at the program in the context of hospitals and you, you see that 60% of all 
Part B drug reimbursement is going through 340B hospitals. You, you come to the conclusion, really, that, that the program is a lot bigger um, than was previously understood. The idea that the 340B program is only 2% or 4% of the U.S. drug market is kind of the wrong way of looking at the program. It, it really makes more sense to think about how big the program is in the context of the hospital, uh, the hospital outpatient setting. Um, secondly, growth in the program um, has obviously been significant over the last six years, but it's had a very big impact on the oncology marketplace. Over 40% of all the Part B reimbursement that goes to 340B hospitals is for oncology drugs. We saw that 86% increase at hospitals that are that have have continually participated in the program. We saw 86% increase in Part B reimbursement for oncology drugs. We see the growth in specialty pharmacy, um, and, and we've seen the shift in the site of care, uh, which is is um, certainly dominated by the 340B hospitals. So, so this growth in the program has had, has had a particularly large impact on the oncology marketplace. And between Medicaid expansion, between community oncology practices, and what's happening in the specialty pharmacy space, um, we believe all of the fundamentals are in place for the program to continue to grow. And we think that growth is going to continue to be um, focused in an outsized way uh, in the oncology marketplace, and and so there's going to continue to be um, the dynamics in place that will have a, a very real a very real impact on on community oncology and, and the overall oncology marketplace in general. Um, so so that gets us through the presentation. It leaves us with about uh, 15 or 20 minutes for for Q and A and closing thoughts. So so Ted, I, I will turn it back to you at this point. Um, for, for questions. Um, thank you, Aaron. This is Tracy. We will now open the webinar to questions from attendees. As a reminder, all listener lines are muted. If you have a question, you can unmute your line by pressing star six on your phone. Please only one question at a time and do not put your phone on hold when the line is unmuted. Any questions? Okay. Now, this um, is Mary with. Yep. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say this is a, a lot of information to digest, which is probably why there aren't any questions at this time. However, uh, if you do have questions um, after you think about this presentation, please feel free to email me, Mary Krasinski, Mary K at coacancer.org, and we'll get your questions answered. Thanks so much for participating in today's webinar. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, thank you. A recording of this webinar will be shared with attendees soon. Um, you will receive these slides, so you'll be, ac be able to access and share the full report at the address given. Um, please visit the Community Oncology Alliance website for news and updates at www.coacancer.org. And last but not least, save the date. The 2016 Community Oncology Conference returns April 14th and 15th, 2016, at the Universal Orlando Resort. Thank you, and have a great day. Okay.